We turn now to verse 12. You are profaning my name in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. That means they were saying that God's work was a burden. Verse 13, you also say, my, how tiresome it is to keep on bringing these offerings to God. Every day we have to bring these offerings and we have to bring the best to God. How tiresome it is. His commandments are a burden. And when that thought comes into our heart that God's commandments are a burden, then we know that we have fallen into the backsliding that characterized the Israelites in Malachi's day. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. Why did they say it was a burden? Because their love had gone. It says in the Old Testament that Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed unto him as a few days because of the love that he had for her. He loved Rachel so much that he slogged for seven years in the sun and the rain and it was just like a few days. And that's always true that where there is love, fervent love, any labor will look light. When labor for the Lord looks like a burden, when a sacrifice we make for the Lord looks like a burden, when I think that something I have done for the church, why doesn't somebody else also pitch in and help? And I have such questions and complaints in my mind. Why aren't brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so also doing their part? When I yield to such thoughts, I can say to myself, love is gone. When Jacob worked for Rachel, he wasn't bothered about whether anybody else was working or not. And that's the way by which we know that we have left our first love. And the crime, the sin that the leader of the church in Ephesus fell into is also what happened here. And God, they were doing God's work, but it was a burden. They had complaints against others as to why aren't they doing their part. Beware of that, brothers and sisters. And you sniff at it. And you bring to God what was taken by robbery. That teaches us that we cannot give to God what belongs to Caesar. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And give to God what belongs to God. In other words, if I have cheated the income tax, it's no use my giving money in the offering box. That money which I have saved by cheating the income tax or cheating some other tax, and I put it in the offering box, God says, what you are putting in the offering box is what you have stolen. It is exactly the same as going to somebody's house, stealing his purse, taking that money, and putting it in the offering box. It's exactly the same when we don't give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. When we don't give, when we don't pay back our debts, and we put money in the offering box. God says, I don't want it. That doesn't belong to you. That belongs to so-and-so. You should have repaid that debt. When we haven't made restitution of money that we have stolen from the office or the factory or whatever it is in the olden days or from the railways, and we haven't paid it back, and we put money in the offering box, God says, I don't want it. You put what is taken by a robbery. You have robbed somebody else, and you come and put it here. And Malachi really let the people have it. And he says, you bring all this, and you bring what is lame or sick, so you bring the offering. In the King James Version it says, you bring what is torn. Torn means torn by the animals. And I want you to turn to a verse in Exodus chapter 22, which tells us the law that God had laid down, that if you find an animal of yours um, torn to pieces in the field, a flesh that's torn to pieces in the field, what you must do with it. Exodus 22, the last verse, verse 31, it said, You shall be holy men to me, therefore you shall not eat any flesh torn to pieces in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. Whom were they to throw that animal that was slain in the field to? To the dogs. What were they doing in Malachi's day? They were taking that animal and bringing it as an offering to God. What were they treating God like? A dog. 
That's it. They were giving to God what God said should be given to the dogs. Can you imagine religious people who got the form of godliness, the temple in the midst, the walls around Jerusalem, but so much in the grip of mammon that they were hesitant to give God the best. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, it is when it touches our money that we find out how spiritual we are. That is clear. When Zacchaeus' attitude to money changed, Jesus said, salvation has come here. Salvation from mammon. Zacchaeus has stopped worshipping mammon. Because his attitude to money changed, he decided to make restitution. Jesus said about a man who was not rich towards God. And that's the danger. That's how it was with these people. They were not rich towards God. They gave to God, but they gave to God like people give to the beggar. When the beggar comes to the door, you're not rich towards him. You, you feel a little bad, so you drop something into his hand. And it's possible for us, we may not treat God like a dog, but perhaps like a beggar. In our giving to God, do we treat him like a beggar? That's a searching question. And that was the problem with these people. He says, so you bring the offering. Should I receive this from your hand? Verse 14, but cursed, this is another word, curse, seven times in the book of, in the short book of Malachi comes the word curse, curse, curse. In fact, the book of Malachi ends with that word curse. Seven times, there's no prophet among all the prophets who speaks so much about curse as Malachi. Jeremiah was another one trying to save people from Babylon. Malachi was trying to save people again from another spiritual Babylon. And we find that despite Malachi's prophecy, the Jews ended up in a spiritual Babylon by the time Jesus came. They were in a spiritual Babylon when Jesus came. But God sent his prophet Malachi to save them from that. But cursed be the swindler. Imagine calling a child of God a swindler. These were God's people. He was not talking to the heathen. He says a swindler. And who is this swindler who has a male in his flock and he vows it, but when the time comes to give to God, he sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. Now notice there, here is a man who says to God, Lord, I will give this, maybe in a time of sickness, maybe in a time of need or difficulty, or when some problem came into his family. He said, oh God, if you will heal me or heal my child or you'll do this, I will do this for you. All right? The healing came, the answer to prayer came, but then he conveniently forgets about the vow he made to God. Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says in chapter 5, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on the earth, therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. That, what that means is that if you are preoccupied with many things in your mind during the day, that will come out in a dream at night. If you are preoccupied with making money, you'll find that comes forth in your dreams at night. And in the same way, he says, like much activity brings forth dreams at night, many words are the identifying mark of a fool. A fool is known by the fact that he keeps on talking to people and to God, saying a lot of things, gossip to people, and a lot of things to God which he doesn't mean. And he says, when you make a vow to God, don't be late in paying it. For he takes no delight in fools who say things which they don't mean. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. That's a serious thing. To say something to God and not do it. If you say something, God says do it. Otherwise, don't say it at all. God is trying to teach his people to be careful with their speech. Don't say, I surrender all to Jesus, if everything is not surrendered. 
God says, if you sing that, then do it. All to Jesus I surrender, then do it. It's a serious thing to sing something in our hymns which we don't mean. Jesus I my cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee. God says, then do it. And this is one of the main reasons for the carnality and the spiritual poverty of so many believers that they are not careful about what they sing in their hymns. I really believe that. Because it is through hymns that we tell the maximum number of lies to God. It's far better when we come to a line of a hymn not to sing it. Let the rest of the, rest of the congregation sing it because I can't honestly say I want to leave all. God appreciates that person because he's honest. He takes that word seriously. It's very important. And God calls a man a swindler who makes a vow, maybe in a hymn, and then he doesn't do it in his daily life. He says, I want to die, Lord. And he goes home and he's got no interest in dying to himself. Now, I, I want to show you a contrast to this in the book of Genesis, chapter 18. Abraham says, I want you to notice this, this is very interesting. What You know, Abraham was once standing by his tent and he saw three men coming towards him. Verse 2, Genesis 18, 2. And when he saw them, he was so hospitable, and he said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, don't pass your servant by. He didn't know who they were. They were just strangers. And he said, Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves. And verse 5, this is what I want you to notice. I will bring, what did he promise to bring? A piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. He says, I'd just like to get you a little bit of bread to eat and he made them sit down and he hurried into the tent and told Sarah verse 6 quickly to make some bread cakes and he went verse 7 and took a tender and choice calf and asked his servants to prepare that and he took the curds and the milk and the calf and the bread and placed it before them that's the difference he said I will bring some bread but he brought ten times more than that now, it's the exact opposite with most people. They say, I'll bring calf, curds, milk, honey, bread, everything. And finally, when they come, they've only got a little bit of bread. But Abraham wasn't like that. He didn't know how much he could bring. So he settled for something less and he said, I'll bring some bread. But then he found he could bring much more. And he brought it. And that is the opposite of what we see God's people in Malachi and a lot of God's people today. They say so many things to God. But when they come with their offering, it's about... 1% of what they promised God that they would bring to him. We have to learn to be extremely careful with the words we speak to God in prayer, private, public, and hymns, lest we also are guilty of telling lies to God. And he has to call us a swindler who says one thing and means another. We have to be very careful. And notice here he says again about his name. Malachi 1.14 My name is feared among the nations. In verse 11 we saw it is honored among the nations. And these were the two charges God brought against the priests in verse 6. Notice, you don't honor me and you don't fear me. Alright? If you don't honor me and you don't fear me, I will get that honor and that fear from the Gentiles. God will always find somebody else to replace the one whom he originally called to serve him. Jesus called Judas Iscariot. He failed. God chose somebody else, the Apostle Paul. In the same way, God can choose any one of us for a particular task and say, I have called you, I have chosen you for a particular ministry in my body. And if he sees that we don't fear him, and we don't honor him, we don't give him the first place in our life, he will take that ministry which was originally planned for you and give it to somebody else who will fear him and honor him. And we'll discover, brothers and sisters, that the judgment seat of Christ, that there was a ministry God had for us, but he couldn't commit it to us because we told him such a lot of lies. We didn't fear him 
We didn't take seriously the vows we made in the meetings, in prayer, in our songs. We didn't live faithfully. And therefore God had to take it away from us and give it to someone else. That's a tragedy. Terrific tragedy. It happened to the Jews. It doesn't happen with one failure. God spoke to the Jews again and again and again and again. Finally he said, I give, give you all up. And so it is. He gave Judas Iscariot many chances. And he gives us many chances too. But remember a time came when God gave up the Jews. A time came when he gave up Judas Iscariot. And a time can come where people play the fool with God. And they can lose either their ministry. And if it carries on further, even their salvation. And that's why we need to fear.